I want to talk about ideas, and I want to start talking about ideas by giving you a quiz um, about people who've had big ideas. So let me start by asking, who recognizes this strapping, handsome young man? Probably nobody. If I gave you his name, would that help? What did he invent? He invented TV. Um, here's him next to an early TV, but who gets the credit for TV? It's Sarnoff, right, who obviously did better in life than this fellow. He got a really nice picture taken later in life. People recognize, people recognize Sarnoff, right? So, so Philo really doesn't get much credit, didn't, didn't get very far on the idea. Um, who recognizes this other young fellow? Tesla, excellent. So here's a picture of uh, Nikola Tesla next to one of his uh, Tesla coils, basically trying to show us how safe alternating current is. That's what he's doing right here. Who gets the credit? Who actually won the race for electricity? Edison. This guy over here, right? Now, Edison actually invented the electric chair in order to prove how dangerous alternating current was. He went and shocked dogs, cats, and eventually a big elephant named Topsy. He electrocuted them publicly to basically show how dangerous this stuff was. So there's a reason why our friend Nicola is sitting on stage calmly reading a book while electricity arcs through him because he understood how safe what he was doing actually was. In fact, Tesla um, so deeply understood uh, technology and, and the electromagnetic spectrum that he invented a whole series of things. If you want to read up on him, uh, I'll give you a link in just a second. Uh, what did this fellow invent? Wireless radio. Guess who also actually invented this? Tesla, right? So if you want to see what things Tesla invented, go, go to read this page at theoatmeal.com. Uh, this is a tribute to Nikola Tesla, and it talks about not only alternating current, uh, radio, et cetera, but x-rays, radar, um, and at the end of his life, he was trying to transmit energy up into the ionosphere with a big tower in Long Island, uh, the Wardenclyffe Tower, which I just donated to a Kickstarter project by this guy to try to restore, to buy back the building uh, where this was and turn it into a Tesla museum. So um, Tesla not only kind of invented the alternating current system, he designed every piece of it the way we use it today from you, you, the plug in appliances to local current to step up and step down transformers to the high power grid. Uh, he invented the turbines that, that generate electricity at Niagara Falls. A whole bunch of stuff came out of his head out of whole cloth. He died a pauper. He died basically in a hotel in Manhattan owing money to the landlords raising pigeons. He was, by the way, an incredible eccentric. Uh, he couldn't eat a meal without measuring and calculating the volume of his food. And the, the maitre d' knew to give him a stack of, of napkins, one for each implement, and he would clean his own stuff. He was really an eccentric. Um, but you know, sometimes doing battle in the intellectual space does that to you. So I want to talk about that a little bit. I really want to take, I want to take the inventor's perspective. So let me talk about uh, another couple of inventors here. I won't even mention these, but these are other also rands. Alicia Gray filed a patent for the telephone two hours after Alexander Graham Bell. Alicia Gray's patent works as drawn, Bell's doesn't. Lars Ericsson, name Ericsson sound familiar? Same thing in, in, in Sweden. He filed a patent for the phone also. Doesn't get that much credit for it, though he did start a company. Um, Popov, radio in Russia. Edwin Armstrong, anybody? FM radio. Nobody's heard of him either. Herbert Matare, this one's a real, uh, nobody ever knows uh, what he did. Herbert Matare, a Frenchman the transistor. Who gets credit? Shockley in his lab. And Shockley actually took all the credit from his colleagues. He was kind of a megalomaniac himself. So put yourself in these people's role, in, in these people's um, sh shoes, and what do you think? So uh, these two people are probably much more recognizable, although we're not used to seeing their pictures. They invented uh, this thing, right? Now, the Wright brothers were 10 years ahead of everybody, seriously. Everybody else was basically putting a, an engine on top of a wing and pushing it down a ramp and hoping it would sort of fly, fly. They invented the wind tunnel. They figured out how to tweak the propeller. They did a whole bunch of stuff. But then, once they started flying, 1904, 5, 6, 7, once they started flying and the press started showing up and taking pictures of them flying around in Ohio, they stopped flying around. And they, they wasted 10 years trying to sell aircraft to armies because those are the only obvious buyers. So they went to the US Army that said, thank you so much. These balloon things are enough for us. They went to the French Army, the German Army. They wasted 10 years of their lives, by which time, 
Curtis and a bunch of others were making better planes and started selling the actual contracts. So these guys never really made it. And they kept the rudder out front like that in their later designs, and the rudder migrated to the back. It's an easier way to actually fly a plane. So they were 10 years ahead and lost it, mostly because they were afraid of losing their intellectual property. So that's the kind of the place I want to go to. And now I want to blow the lens up um, a whole lot, because I want to talk first a little bit about the creator's dilemma. If you're an inventor with a good idea, what are you going to do? Do you want to, there's kind of two paths. One is you try to lock down the intellectual property. You, you hire lawyers, you patent, you do this, you do that. And by the way, as we've just heard really ably, um, the patent and copyright systems are wildly out of control. So the copyright system, right, goes back to the Statute of Anne from England, 1710. The first Statute of Anne gives you 14 years of copyright protection, which you have to apply for by writing in, and it's renewable only once. So it's a maximum of 28 years of protection from the date of publication of the work. This is in the era where it takes a couple weeks to sail across the Atlantic, right? Also in the era where people like um, uh, ben Franklin and others were busy pirating British works. There's a whole bunch of controversy around this. What is copyright today? Anybody know? Life plus 70. Life plus 70 for private works. Life plus 95 for corporate works. And life means the copyright doesn't start when the, public, when the thing is published. It starts when the author dies. And the author could live 30, 40 years on. So we're talking 30, 40 years plus 95 years. And the whole reason for this is that um, Mickey Mouse might fall into the public domain. So the 1998 Copyright Term Extension Act, passed under Bill Clinton, damn him, um, well, everybody knows it's, it's called both the Sonny Bono Act, because he was the proponent of the act, and the Mickey Mouse Act, because it was written to extend copyright so that the mouse wouldn't fall into the public domain so we wouldn't have parodies about the mouse. Ooh. <laughs> but what it's done is it's denuded the commons. So I want to talk a little bit about the commons, because I think what's happening here is a plundering, a pilfering of the commons. Now, we used to live together on the commons. There's a really nice book written in 1944, The Great Transformation, by Carl Polanyi, a great historian who had a brother, Michael Polanyi, who was a great mathematician. So Polanyi writes in The Great Transformation about the transformation to industrial revolution. And he describes how we stayed alive before that, through householding, reciprocity, and redistribution. There weren't markets for everything. There wasn't money in common use for everything, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The, the, this world we take completely for granted right now with ownership over everything is very, very new. And I will suggest to you that it's a completely out of whack, out of balance current situation that is being healed. So my thesis is that we're at the beginning of a great rebalancing. It's early. It could take 300 years. After Gutenberg, by the way, Gutenberg also dies poor and broke. He, he sells his stuff to another guy who makes a lot of money publishing um, Bibles and papal indulgences. The printing press is used for religious purposes for 200 years because the church effectively suppresses it. And the rulers are like, yeah, we don't like this thing. People could publish their own edicts and stuff and, and argue against us. So we're happy to suppress. 200 years, nothing happens around the printing press. The next 200 years, major turmoil around Europe because all of a sudden people can print and that rushes ideas around, et cetera, et cetera. So the commons, sometimes I'll give a speech and I'll say, who, who can tell me what the commons is? And there will be like 30 seconds of, of, of embarrassing silence and then somebody will say, that's like forests, right? I'll be like, good, good, that's a start. It's forests, aquifers, fisheries, natural resources in general. It's also the new commons. Now, Lynn Ostrom, who's an, uh, an economist, won the Nobel Prize for Economics a couple years ago for studying governance models around the commons, which is really interesting and unusual, right? So what we've been doing is we've been plundering the commons. Who has heard Ray Anderson of Interface Flooring give a talk or read any of his work? Just a couple of you. Highly recommend you go listen to one of his talks online. It's a beautiful talk. He does a really great job. At the end of it, he writes a poem that one of his workers wrote that, that told him that his workers were understanding, internalizing what he'd been trying to say. And what Ray Anderson understood is that we've been plundering the commons. We've turned the commons into natural resources. Natural resources are something that companies go out and sequester and capture and basically make their own. And you know, there's nothing like monopoly rents. So what you really want is a resource that nobody else can get access to. That's the best possible thing for your company. It's your fiduciary responsibility because you're supposed to maximize profits. 
Now what's happened, so the, the early enclosure movements that, happened, that started in England around the, before the Industrial Revolution actually pushed people off the land where they lived in common, in a commonwealth. All nice names, right? Um, we, we wonder about where, where all this language went. Pushed people off the commons. Now we're seeing a whole second enclosure movement, which you've just heard described. So our genes are being patented. Now genes that occur naturally in nature, in the world, a little pattern, a little piece of it that might cause breast cancer has been patented, walled off, and that means that other research centers can't work on it. So the rest of the world doesn't get to do that because these guys think that this is going to create an advantage that lets them solve cancer, cure cancer, like they're going to do that ahead of everybody else. So this is a very critical moment. And we're, we're in, a, in a place where companies have, you know, look at the old Greek tragedy. They've got hubris. They've got um, regulatory capture like you wouldn't believe in sector after sector after sector. Everywhere. They're basically in charge of government as much as they want to be. And they've made a game where they can win. They've made a game where they get to sort of run the table. Now, the good news is there's this other thing going on at the same moment. So that world I've just described is kind of like consumer mass marketing run amok. Uh, hyper-capitalism, Naomi Klein calls it disaster capitalism, kind of gone crazy. At the same exact moment, right now as we live, there's this other thing coming up, made easy by this new internet thing. Because now it costs almost nothing to leave an idea, a song, a movie, code in the world for other people to use. Now, if you're an inventor, if you're Herbert Matare or any of these people or any software genius these days, and I know I use a product called The Brain, which is a concept mapping tool. And I've been using it for 15 years. I can show it to you on a break. It's a lovely tool, but it's proprietary. And this guy's been struggling with his company for 15 years. It's a lovely tool. I wish he would just open source it. Because at one point, about six years ago, he almost lost the company and all his IP. He had an even number of board members who were evenly divided about liquidating the company or trying to make it stay alive. And he successfully re-engineered everything, blah, 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 but he's really been struggling for 15 years. I know lots of these sorts of people, and their ideas die and get put on a shelf as competitive IP by some other company. The article this morning was about a company called Nuance Communications that kind of owns most of the IP around speech recognition. So Siri, on your nice new iPhone 4S or 5, Siri uses Nuance technology. But Nuance, the poor people who invented Nuance, this older couple, there was another article about them recently. They, they, they ran a company called Dragon Systems. They, in the dot-com run-up, they basically sold the company. A guy who was a, a moron, who, who was basically fraudulent, used to work at Apple on the Newton Project. He, got put, he got, became CEO of this thing, committed fraud, got put away. They lost the company. They lost everything. All gone. So the actual inventors of Nuance have nothing to do with Nuance anymore. It's just people who own the IP and are busy sort of making sure it lives every place. But much more interestingly, more importantly, our commons is being denuded all the time by these laws. I would love to see us return to the Statute of Anne. Back then it took two weeks for, for you know, a liner to cross the ocean. What we want is a head start. Read Larry Lessig on this. Larry Lessig has written very eloquently and has other alternative models to do things with. So my little journey into this space started from realizing somewhere in the mid-90s that I don't like the word consumer. So I was a tech industry analyst. I was sitting kind of at the 50-yard line of the dot-com revolution because I wrote a newsletter, and my boss was really famous. Her name is Esther Dyson. She was really famous in the tech field. Everybody wanted to show their startup at our conference, so they had to show us what they were doing. Esther was busy in Eastern Europe and in other places, and I was writing the newsletter, so they had to show me. And I realized in the middle of this that everybody uses the word consumer. We're, we're accustomed to it. It's just a term of art. We just use it. But if I raised this, if I brought it up in conversation, I said, you know, I really don't like that word. Half the people would say, you know what? I hate it too. This is just, I, why? What's going on? And we'd start talking a little bit. And we'd say, customer and client are fine words. Member, citizen, participant, individual, household, student, fan, all awesome. Consumer eyeballs, not so cool. To consume is to destroy often wastefully, as in consumed by fire. And we are no longer the stupid endpoints of a linear business model. Everybody's now trying to invent circular business models. They're trying to invent this cradle to cradle system that McDonough talks about. We're trying to create systems that don't deplete the commons, but help nourish and grow the commons. And this is a big shift of brain. 
This is a huge design difference. And then there's people around the world who've got this idea in different ways. Have you read the design accord? You're most, a lot of you are designers. Have you read the design accord? Any one of its three or four versions. Do not pass go, do not collect $200. Go read the design accord. It's not exactly what I'm talking about, but it's really designers coming together to try to state some moral ethical principles about design in the world. This stuff is really important and designers are the ones who are creating all these things. Lessig does a really eloquent job of, of talking about how code, software code, is now law. If, we, if, if you try to circumvent the code that is protecting a movie on a DVD, you're, you're, create, you're, cause, you're committing a felony. That's a felony. Um, we have felonized fair use, by the way, because it's impossible to get that clip of, of, of uh, you know, uh, Schwarzenegger saying, I'd be back. Um, illegally onto your thing. Now what you would probably do is go to YouTube and just try to quote it into your presentation. But this is really a, a crucial moment for us and I actually think that these other movements that are busy sharing openly and there's thousands upon thousands of them. They don't all have leaders. Some of them do. You know, Linus Torvalds is effectively the benevolent dictator of Linux, the operating system that powers half the computers on the internet. But there's other systems like um, Wikipedia Jimmy Wales really isn't in control of the Wikipedia anymore. You know, he's nominally the guy who started it and he had a great idea. But he will tell you, I, I try to say stuff, but they kind of go wherever they want. It doesn't really have a center. Um, if you're Encyclopedia Britannica, you're not crazy about the Wikipedia, right? And put yourself in the shoes of the Britannica just for a second. You have a financial responsibility, you have employees, you've got senior staff, who have families and pay country club memberships and tuition and orthodontist bills, and they do direct sales of a large thing of books that people buy and put on their shelves. You're going to fire them all? You're just going to have them all walk in and say, guys, our days are numbered, you got to go? If leadership had been really courageous, they might have had a reinvention session, and they might have built an educational institution on top of Wikipedia and donated the Britannica to Wikipedia and figured out how to work together, maybe. Long shot, right? Not if you're Britannica. So that's happening over and over again in sector after sector. These companies that are busy locking down and trying to, to maintain the deepest, longest profits they possibly can by sequestering as much of this commons as they can just to themselves, keeping everybody else away from it, are being fought, basically. It's not really an open battle, but it is. Um, by a whole series of open institutions. Science has been cracked open. It's just beautiful. Um, if you're a physicist, chances are you look at archive.org, A-R-X-I-V.org, all the time, because it's where papers are now published, physics papers. And with the Large Hadron Collider and all the stuff going on, physics is going crazy. What archive.org did was it allowed Physicists from little places who didn't have the credentials to publish in the big peer-reviewed uh, journals, which is the old way, um, to suddenly get noticed. So physicists in Burundi and Botswana and Bolivia and Bangladesh and the C countries and the D countries are now more visible in the world. Um, in astronomy, amateur astronomy has gone crazy. It's totally cool. In mapping, there's a project called Open Street Maps uh, that where ordinary citizens have mapping parties and they walk around, then they upload their GPS data into a common database, they then tag it all up. Um, there's towns in Germany that have been so well mapped by open street maps groups that now they're mapping the latitude and longitude of every tree and shrub in town. Because <laughs> they already did where the public library is and where the bookstores are and where all the public restrooms are. That's, that was done. Man, they got that. Right? And there's this whole controversy between Apple and Google on maps and all that. O OSM, OpenStreetMaps, is playing a role in that, in that as well. So there's this beautiful world opening up of shared things that is in conflict, and we haven't seen a major conflagration between the two. So Microsoft, and partly, I can tell you maybe a little bit of the politics behind this. IBM, early on, um, so I was an industry analyst, and, and IBM was one of the big fish in the pond, so whenever IBM did something, we would jump up and write about it, try not to take, take down the podium, um, we would jump up and write about it and say, well, here's what we think is going to happen. Uh, I, it looked like IBM was going to die, that, that the mainframe was, a, was a, just a total dinosaur, and uh, we were trying to figure out how they were going to stay alive. And then internally to IBM, there were a couple champions of open source. And I got to interview uh, one of these people back around 98 or something like that, 99. And um, 
And he said, well, what we did was we took our engineers and we had them look at the Apache project. Who has heard of Apache? Oh, good, many more than I thought. So Apache is web server software. When you click on a link on any website, Apache is probably 80% of the time the software that's saying, oh, you need uh, this picture from here, this page from here, I'm going to start sending them to you, and you reassemble them in your browser. That's how the web works. So IBM downloaded the Apache code, looked at it, and said, this is pretty good code. We like what this group is doing. They then looked around internally and realized they had five different web server projects for their five different hardware platforms that couldn't talk to each other. So they adopted Apache and started donating their intellectual property to the project. Then they did the same thing for Linux. Linux saved IBM. Because all of a sudden, after 10 years of internal struggle, serious struggle with major initiatives announced to make their five different computer platforms talk to each other, putting Linux and, and the, the internet, TCPIP, on all these machines saved the company. They still sell mainframes. All this stuff is still going on, right? So there's a commercial company that realized that open source was really complementary to their business. They now do more than $2 billion worth of services business around all of this, and they contribute to the commons all the time. The reason I tell the story also is that they have the, one of the world's largest patent portfolios, quite possibly the world's largest patent portfolio. They and Hitachi in Japan is also a major patenter. So Microsoft had little incentive to try to sue Linux out of existence because it was a threat to Windows. So you have these defensive battles shaping up all over the place, behind the scenes, in this war. You have large companies that have decided that open source is pretty cool. They're kind of defenders in a way of, of that. And you have large players who are busy um, trying to figure out how do they take down this threat because a lot of companies now feel like Britannica. In a lot of industries, what you're doing is doable for not a lot of money. This is something I ask people a lot. Could, could we do the value you think you bring to the market? Could we do it if I gave you almost no budget? Could you get it done if you had the cooperation and goodwill of people? For instance, in education. Could you create educated, well-rounded citizens if I give you almost no budget? The answer to that kind of is yeah. Yeah. You could get people to come together. There's en enormous, insane amounts of educational material. And I don't mean courseware online. I mean participating in the Wikipedia, being a citizen, being a Wikipedian is a way of learning about the world. It's a way of learning about social process. It's a way of learning about everything. You could take any object, certainly a smartphone, but you could take a cup of coffee. And if you sort of opened your eyes, you could learn from it about biology, nutrition, stimulants, neurotransmitters. You could learn about the history of coffee, uh, fair, all the way from, from fair trade today, all the way back to colonialism and the cafe society and the enlightenment. You could learn about economics and supply chain and how does Starbucks convince us to pay $4 for a cup of coffee? The Maxwell House people really wanted, wanted to know that one. Um, so there's, there's everything to be learned from everything. So I could create an educational system without a lot of funds. You could do this sector after sector. So one of the things I'm trying to figure out now, and this is where I want to spend the last couple minutes of what I'm going to talk about is, um, so how would you do, what would you build now if you were in business? And I think the secret now is to take the commons as a given, help build the commons, even if that means that your assets need to be put in the commons and shared openly, and then figure out where the new businesses are. Because there's some new businesses to be had even when the commons is out there. The old uh, business dictum of scarcity equals value is not a natural law. It's just a superstition. You can have value if you have abundance. Helping people find stuff. Being there personally, personal service of all different kinds. It's a whole series of ways to actually create value. And that's a, that's a, a long and different conversation as well. Um, but we're at a moment where businesses need to deeply rethink what they do. And most of them are not. Most of them are sort of, you know, the, the deer in the headlights. Uh, they're trying to see if they kind of duck and wait long enough that maybe this problem will go away. And, and it's not a problem that'll go away. It's actually a sea change that's happening to us, with us, around us, right this very moment. And if we deal with it well, it takes us into a beautiful place. I mean, I, I'm really optimistic. I, I'm sort of a long-term optimist and a short-term skeptic because I think there's going to be a tremendous amount of short-term pain. There's an awful lot of businesses that are going to have their Britannica moment and not face it well. Many of them, many of them are going to lock down intellectual property so well 
that their moment will be delayed for 20 years and the battle would just struggle on instead of actually pitching in and trying to solve the world's diseases together, right? And, and all this stuff about, about innovation and the great man theory of innovation and so forth is really kind of a lie. If you've read Stephen Johnson's book, Where, Where Ideas Come From, uh, if you ever watched the old Connections series, uh, James Burke, who watched Connections? It was a big motivator for me, yes. Uh, and in Connections, Burke basically says, look, there was this little thing over here and then this guy named Jacquard so that's okay. Then this guy named Jacquard invents a loom, and then over here you have something else, and all of a sudden you've got you know, digital computers that use a bit, a bit of this, a bit of that. That's what's happening here. And the cool thing is that right now, we can see what everybody else is doing at almost no cost. We can look over people's shoulders. Um, some people hate Twitter and social media. I had a conversation way before Twitter existed with a friend of mine, a very thoughtful friend, and he said, wouldn't it be cool if you could look over the shoulder of a half dozen people you really respected who had different sorts of perspectives into the world, if you could look over their shoulder and see what they're thinking and what's up, that's what Twitter is. There's a whole bunch of generous, interesting people who are out there saying, oh, did you think of this, look at this, read this, go do this, whatever. And if you follow only them instead of all your BFFs, which is a bad Twitter strategy, by the way, but if you follow only the interesting people, your tweet stream becomes your news feed. So you'll find out about new events right away there before they can even make it into the news, whether it's earthquakes or, or whatever. Um, and you'll be in touch because you just need to let go of knowing everything that's going on and learn how to be a little zen about it and dip your ladle in the stream every now and then and take a nice sip and then like pour the rest back out. So that's the world we're in. We're, it's a world of overwhelming amounts of information, a world of companies trying to capture and lock away a lot of it and make it their own, um, a world where other people are busy in an insanely dynamic and beautiful way, sharing information, building cool new stuff, and building stuff that's so sophisticated, you didn't know we could do that. So for example, is anybody a flying hobbyist? Either you fly or you do remote control airplanes or you fly flight simulators? We have one flying hobbyist, okay. I'll give you a little anecdote in this field just to see how complicated things can get. So all of you probably have seen or used a flight simulator, a little piece of software or a game at the arcade that looks like you're flying. Terrific. Uh, it won't, won't surprise you to know that there is a couple of open source flight simulator programs, X-Plane and Flight Gear. What might surprise you is that there are virtual airlines online. So you can go sign up to pretend to be an SAS pilot or a Lufthansa pilot. And in these systems, they've emulated as much about commercial flying as they can. So th you, you bid on, on legs to fly. And uh, as you get seniority, you bank like your retirement account. And as you get more seniority, you get the better legs. And then there are people who actually sit at home. So next time you're in the airport and you look up at the big board, some very small percentage of those flights are being shadowed by hobbyists at home who are pretending to be that Lufthansa flight. They, get, they, they configure the same aircraft and they're gonna do the same flight plan. And there's a bunch of other people sitting at home on a system called VATSIM, the Virtual Air Traffic Control Simulator who have headsets on who are saying, you know, United 242 Heavy vectored 180 and climbed to 36,000 as a hobby. As a hobby, because they love this thing. And those people would probably make good stand-in flight controllers in a pinch, or pilots, or whatever, because they know a lot more than the average person ever knew about flying. That's just flying. Now picture you're a seven-year-old who'd like to learn something about aerodynamics or flight or whatever. I didn't have this when I was seven, right? Crazy, crazy. You could be connected to the real world, to real people. You could learn with real instrumentation. You know, there's simulators of the space shuttle where every switch is documented and does stuff. You can go, you can, there are um, radio telescopes around the world and optical telescopes around the world that you can direct to a piece of sky that you'd like to take a snapshot of. They will send you the picture and publish the picture to everybody, of course. Um, this is just opened up all over the place. So I'm really hopeful in the long run. I think that we're in a, in a, in a spot in history where if we act to accelerate the positive shareable change, really good things will happen. And if we don't, um, the other future really scares me. It's a future of surveillance. It's a future of ownership by a few companies that continue to create excessive profits and kind of lock away a lot of our cultural uh, uh, patronage, our, um, our, our cultural heritage. Uh, basically, 
keep us from being the full and lovely humans that we could be. Thank you. <laughs>